Okay, so today we're going to be talking um, a little bit about understanding and responding, mostly responding to challenging behaviors. Understanding behaviors can be quite simple, but also very complicated. And so uh, sometimes I can sum it up by saying, you know, and I'll get into that here in just a minute about what exactly behavior is. Uh, but a lot of it are just very simple things that we can do to respond when we see some challenging behaviors. So I will go ahead and uh, introduce myself. First of all, October is Down Syndrome Awareness Month. I'm sure we're all uh, aware of that and familiar with that. So happy Down Syndrome Month to all of us. This is uh, my son and my daughter. My daughter will be 26 in uh, a few weeks on the 22nd of October. And my son is not far behind her. He just turned 24. So again, I was a, a former director of behavior support for both general education and special education in school districts. Um, I was a special education consultant for Region 10 and Region 8. Those are uh, support centers that we have here in Texas for all of our school districts. One was located in Dallas and one was located in East Texas. So I spent a lot of time at various school districts. I'm, of course, a former special education teacher uh, for uh, over 11 years. I spent the majority of that time in behavior classrooms, working with students with significantly interfering behaviors. Um, I have a master's degree in education, special education, with an emphasis in applied behavior analysis. And I am a board certified behavior analyst and a licensed behavior analyst here in Texas, and also a certified trauma professional. Um, I work uh, closely with our Texas School Safety Center on developing behavior threat assessments so that we can determine um, if there are threats that are present in our schools in order to keep our children safe here in Texas. And I am a um, I work closely with school-based law enforcement in that um, particular job when I'm doing that. So I wear a lot of different hats. I currently work for a company that provides uh, behavior services and skills for school districts. And that is uh, the director here in Texas for- Let's Re put your, um, here, let me have that. And so I will go ahead and get started simply with we talk about why behaviors occur and understanding behaviors. And I can tell you that every behavior is some form of communication. We are either attempting to get attention, to escape and avoid things that we may not be comfortable with, that are too difficult for us, or that we just do not prefer to do. I can say that with exercise. I do that on the regular. Uh, we may be having behaviors in order to get access to something that we want or we need. And we also understand that, you know, challenging behaviors or really all behaviors may occur because there is something internal or private um, that could be occurring. And I think about things like medical conditions. Sometimes we exhibit certain behaviors because we are experiencing medical conditions or mental health conditions. So these are all things that can oftentimes be what we would call in my line of work, the function of behavior, that I always come back and say, these are these are just reasons why we see behavior occur. And everything we do is a behavior. And oftentimes when I think, gosh, you know, these kids are really struggling, I just have to scroll social media and I'm reminded that adults struggle with their own behaviors and understanding and communicating effectively and how to get attention um, appropriately, you know, um, maybe escaping and or avoiding things they do not understand or that are too difficult for them to understand. And so all of these things that we see are quote unquote causes of behavior, we see throughout our lifetime. And it's not just, um, you know, limited to, to children or young adults that are learning uh, certain skills. We see this in um, all of us throughout our lifetime. And so uh, I want to focus more on, you know, not just understanding behavior, but responding appropriately to behavior. I've said this uh, from the time that my daughter was born, um, and it has paid off for me. The, there's, you know, I don't know if there's necessarily an article I can pull to tell you this, but I can tell you that from the time that she was very little, um, I looked at each behavior that occurred and thought to myself, how is this going to look in adulthood? 
And how is this, could this progress to be a positive, wonderful thing uh, that would facilitate um, access, employment, happiness, uh, a productive life, independence? Or how could this be a barrier to those things? And so it was very difficult. I was not always the life of the party when I was out with my friends who might have let certain behaviors slide uh, with their children because I knew that behavior was something that could oftentimes become, um, you know, I don't want to say, I mean, the easiest word to be would be a habit. It's something that is learned. It's something that continues. And so I was always very cautious and making sure that, and I, I used to sum it up by saying, if this isn't appropriate um, at 13, then I'm not going to continue to allow it at three. You know, and that's a hard, like I said, I wasn't always the life of the party. So when other people might have giggled when their child learned their first cuss word or learned how to spit or learned how to do certain things, I, I was all over that because I thought, you know, this is something that could possibly continue later on in life. And one of the things that I became very aware of as an educator very early on was that I found that the world in general, uh, people in general, education, uh, the education system and just society is uh, can be very patient and understanding of individuals who may have difficulties learning new skills or may have difficulties with their speech and challenges with articulation. But the world became less forgiving when behaviors became challenging. And I can tell you this because um, as a, you know, as an educator, I was called more into classrooms for students whose IQ probably surpassed mine. You know, they, they were students who did not have deficits in their intellectual disability, but had very significant behaviors. And they wanted them out of that classroom quickly. And so it became very apparent to me that, you know, I could expect the world in general and education in general, to be more willing to, to work and have exhibit some patience with individuals who were struggling with, um, you know, intellectual disabilities or understanding, but not so forgiving when it came to behavior. And with that in mind, I, like I said, I approached everything by saying, you know, I'm going to look at this and how is this, you know, how is this behavior that is being exhibited at three how could this manifest and become a more significant behavior? And how do I teach a more appropriate behavior? So I always looked at this from birth to adulthood. And, um, you know, that's a, that's a great way for us, I think, to, to possibly approach this is making sure that we know that early childhood intervention is the best way to um, respond to challenges whether they be challenges with our speech and language communication, um, OT, occupational therapy, we always want that window of early childhood and it's the same for behavior. Now, with that being said, I cannot stress the importance of consistency. And we know this because when we get sent home, I was a young mother, first time mother when my daughter was born and I was a very, um, carefree. I don't appear that way now, always, now that life has gone on and I'm older, but I was very carefree and, you know, was not in the field of education. I was actually in radio and television. And when I was sent home uh, with my daughter, they talked a lot about putting her on a schedule. And I thought, why do I have to put a baby on a schedule? And I realized pretty quickly why I needed to put a baby on a schedule so that that way I could sleep and I could function. And we had some consistency. So from early on, we recognize the importance of consistency. And I think about the consistency that is present in our everyday lives. In our place of employment, we like consistency. We want there to be consistent expectations. And when those expectations are not met, we expect consistency in the way we respond to those. We understand that not everything is black and white and that there is a lot of gray area but I think it's extremely important for us to understand that our expectations need to be consistent and we need to have consistent responses to appropriate behavior, behavior that we want to see, 
That's the, the behavior that we want to see more often and appropriate responses and consistent responses to the behaviors that we do not want to see. And we also want to have those consistent expectations. If this is a behavior that I would not allow at home, then I do not allow that at school. If this is not allowed at school, then I do not allow that at home. Now, I keep in mind, you know, not everything is black and white. I understand the expectations of school is very different from home. But I think about some of those core expectations that we have. And so I think that is where, and hey, I am a, I have a stepdaughter with a two-year-old. That's where I'm headed to that party. And I do not follow these rules when that two-year-old comes to my house. <laughs> I do not follow, you know, when she's like, he can't have this and he can't. I'm like, well, you know. So I get it that there are different expectations that are often in place in different environments. So when our children go to different settings, we know that those expectations may look a little different. But when we're, you know, we're dealing with some challenging behavior, it is important that we strive for consistency. And that includes in every setting and environment that we can, because those consistent expectations and consistent responses that we provide builds a learning history. And that replaces, you know, the more I have to practice that, the more I have to expect that it becomes a habit for me. And so I think that I cannot stress that enough. Sometimes we think of just consistency with our expectations, but I think our responses need to be consistent as well. And as a parent, I can understand there are times where I am more frustrated than I was yesterday when the same behavior occurred. And so my behavior may be different when I respond to it. But that is why I like to try to look at things like rules or contracts or expectations that are put into place where I can literally follow. This is exactly what I expect of you. And this is exactly what the response will be every time, even when I'm tired. Even when we're at a birthday party, even when we are at grandmother's house, this is the expectation and this is the response that you can expect from me. And I try to deliver that consistently every time. Yeah. <laughs> Whenever I have parents reach out to me and say, listen, I'm experiencing some extremely challenging behavior. One of the first things that I ask them is, is there a pattern? And this goes the same for teachers. I'll have teachers reach out and say, listen, I have a student with this behavior. The first question, other than just defining the behavior and exactly what it is and what it looks like and sounds like, I always say, is there a pattern with this behavior? And, you know, I just recently noticed a new behavior with my, with my own child. And I had to go back and ask myself, is there a pattern with this behavior? If I can try to pinpoint when it started, and even if I can't, even if I'm like, you know, this has been going on since as long as I can remember, but I still try to look for patterns of when that behavior occurs. And we have to think about that for many reasons. And the most important is because the, the most important response we should have to challenging behaviors or what are we going to do to prevent them? And so in order to prevent challenging behaviors, I'm always looking for patterns so that I can get ahead of that. So that I can say before this behavior occurs, I want to be able to prevent it because I don't even want it to start because that saves us a lot of energy, a lot of trouble, a lot of stress, a lot of potential to make a mistake with our responses. And so I'm always looking for that pattern. So when you think about challenging behaviors that you have with your child, you may say, well, it's every time I say no, or I've noticed that it's every Monday that it seems to get worse. Or I feel like that, you know, on the weekends, uh, we see, you know, a significant increase in this behavior or in the afternoons, uh, you know, and then we start to just take a little journal and just write that down. And you can even create just ones with all the dates listed and a.m., p.m., noon. Then you may be able to see, hey, this is happening a lot during uh, the first few days of the week. And then I would have to stop and say, what's going on on Monday and Tuesday that's different from Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday? And it could be that your child visits another parent on the weekends. So I would have to say, are they getting enough sleep? 
Is there a change in their routine that may affect their behavior, a change in expectations? You know, we were, you know, my kids came from a family that, you know, where I, you know, we were a divorced family when they were very young and there were different expectations when they would go to their other parents home when they came back to me. And I could tell you, I would be thinking to myself, hey, this is definitely a, a challenging behavior that I see more on Mondays when my kids return from a different environment. It could be that I notice it more in the afternoon because my child may be hungry. My child may be tired. And so I'm always looking for patterns for behavior. Could it be something in the environment? Could it be their schedule change? Could it be a change in the people that they are around? And so I would encourage you that when you start to dissect behaviors, that you consider looking for patterns of behaviors. And you can do that the same way that you would do that with a food allergy. Your doctor may ask you to track what you eat because they're trying to determine if you're allergic to something. So, hey, if you drink milk or you eat gluten, this is the response that you get. So think about it in a way where you're trying to determine what could be causes of behavior. And you do that by collecting a little data. And I would encourage you to try to look for patterns when you're dissecting behavior and trying to find the why behind behaviors occurring. We talked a little bit about why we do look at patterns. And I tell educators this, I tell parents this because I believe this with everything in me. Uh, all the years I've been you know, working with significantly challenging behavior, 90% of my energy should be spent on addressing the environment and trying to my own behavior, looking at my own behavior, if I've established consistent responses, if I have consistently established expectations, um, I'm doing everything I can. 90% of my effort is spent on prevention because once behavior begins to occur, and guys, you know this, I can tell you, it spins out of control really quick. You know, it can get very scary when we have dangerous behaviors and we have, you know, children who are running out of the home. I have a pool in my backyard, you know, and that's one of the things that I think about. You know, I, I think about constantly looking at the environment and what am I doing with that pool to prevent the, the two-year-old grandchild from slipping into the pool. And so I try to think about behaviors that way. I'm trying to do everything I can within the environment to control the environment so that I prevent the behavior. I can remember uh, going to one home where a parent, I walked in and there were toys. I mean, I could hardly walk through the house. Toys everywhere. And when I got there, she said, you know, this is an example of the behavior that we deal with. Um, watch, I will tell him it's time to pick up and he will have a tantrum. And so my first question was, why are there this many toys? I would not want to pick up this many toys either. This is overwhelming. This is going to take all day. And so I was like, why are there this many toys out? And she was like, well, these are all of his toys. And I was like, I understand that these are all of his toys. But if the behavior is, is that the child doesn't want to pick the toys up and they want to get every toy out. Being the adult, why don't we modify and change how many toys are accessible to him? And that way we prevent the problem altogether. So why don't we get a bin and we put his favorite toys, the ones we know he plays with every time in this bin and we'll, we'll box up our other ones and then we will gradually pull out another box but why don't we practice learning how to clean up and responding to that request with one box of toys versus 12 or 15 boxes of toys? That is changing the environment in order to prevent the behavior. If I know that I have a child that struggles with certain things when demands are placed, then I have to say, I'm going to look at that demand and say, how can I modify that? How can I make that demand easier or break it into smaller pieces so that that way they are more likely to respond positively when I give them that request? 
And so when we think about behavior, if we can try to look at this and say 90% of my energy will be spent trying to prevent the behavior by controlling the environment and by being able to address my own behaviors. And that is kind of what I told that parent. This becomes your behavior and your job to put the toys away in a bin and only allow this one box of toys. You can do that when the student is at school. And then guess what we've done? We just prevented this huge mess in this house, which is very overwhelming. And it was the reason, one of the reasons why you called me here. But it also helps prevent the tantrum that follows when you ask that child to pick up. Because this is an overwhelming task for this child at his age. This is overwhelming for anyone. Even at my age, the thought of having to pick up all these toys is overwhelming. Then I spend 5% of my energy on responding to the behavior while it's happening. If I've done 90% of prevention, then I shouldn't have that much energy. You know, I, I've, I've used all of my energy to prevent the behavior, and I'm going to focus about 5% on how I'm responding. And the most important thing is saying I'm responding consistently every time. Then I spend the other 5% of my time going back and saying, could I have responded differently? Are there consequences? And what do those consequences look like? We know that when we think about consequences, those don't have to always be negative. But, you know, let's just consider it being a punishment consequence or a cost response. Like I'm going to take access to your phone away. I'll always try to come back with parents and say it is so much easier to have a child earn something rather than remove something. Because removing something feels like punishment. If you tell me that you're taking away my driver's license uh, because of something, that's going to be punishment for me. And I'm not going to like that. And it's going to feel like you're taking something away because you are. <laughs> and that is a punishment. But if we say you earn things by driving appropriately, then I'm more likely to be able to feel like I'm earning that responsibility by exhibiting appropriate behaviors. So that is why, again, it falls on that 90% prevention. I have to have systems in place of saying, hey, my child will earn screen time. They will earn the opportunity to have access to videos or games or uh, an iPad instead of me having to fight with them to take it from them. It is so much easier to have limitations in place already and allow them the opportunity to earn it rather than taking it from them. And I hope that makes sense. I will pause briefly to see if you guys have any questions about that. Uh, that one particular thing, it is, you know, it is proven that we get a better response again when children earn access to items versus when we have to take them away. So if we have a problem with a child that's spending 90 you know, percent of their day on an iPad or a phone, then it would be much easier for me to have in place a schedule already or a system where they earn time on their phone. So first you complete this and this, and then you earn this. And then there is a time hold on that. It could be 30 minutes, but getting that schedule in place is so much easier than fighting back and forth because when we come in and say, oh my gosh, he's been on the iPad or the phone all day long. Give me that phone. You've been on it too long. Well, that feels like punishment. It's so much easier for me to say, you may have access to your phone from this or from for your iPad or a video from this time to this time. And then the schedule is we take a break and we do this. Then you have time from this to this, and then you take a break and we have it in place. Now, it's not always easy to do that because they're used to having it. They're used to having access to what they want, but having a system set up in place where they either earn access to that or there is a schedule around that is so much easier than us being able to say, oh, he's been on this all day. He probably shouldn't be. I should probably try to take it away from him because at least with a schedule, there's warning. I know if someone schedules me to exercise, I'm not going to like it and I'm not going to be looking forward to it, but at least I know it's coming. 
you know, then you may see some other behaviors because they know it's coming. But the reality is at least it becomes consistent and I know and I can prepare for that. And it doesn't feel as harsh as someone just coming and saying, well, no more. Give me that because that definitely feels like punishment. We have a couple of questions in the chat, but I don't know if you wanted to do that or keep going. <laughs> oh, well, we can, if you want to, if they put them in the chat, great, we'll keep going. And then I'll come back and, and answer them that way. Because I know we we only have a limited amount of time. So I want to hit everything, but then I'll definitely come back and, and answer those. All right. Um, and so when we think about the expectations that we put into place for our kids, we need to make sure, and guys, this goes for adults. This is not just with our kids. These are concrete, simple, and clear expectations. I can remember working at a job where they had very strict dress code. And I remember thinking, this is ridiculous. This is stupid. But it was very clear, you know, and they had like, these shoes are unacceptable. You, Your fingers have to touch the bottom. Of, I mean, it was very clear. And so I thought, well, at least while I'm shopping for work clothes, I know exactly what to buy. So I may not always agree with the expectations, but in my mind, I'm like, they're simple, they're clear, they're very easy for me to understand. And I also want to make sure that when I'm dealing with reinforcement, uh, you know, like them having the opportunity to earn something, that I'm very clear on that expectation and I stick to it. So if they earn something, they I have to follow through with that. So uh, it's very simple. It's very clear. I think about first and then guys, we work in a first and then society, you know, first you pay for this, then you get this first, you do the work, a job, then you get paid. You know, you want to, to buy something at the store, you pay for it. They deliver it to you. They hand it to you. We live in a first and then society. And so I'm very careful about saying, you know, that's as simple as it can get first, you do this and then you get this. And so I'm very simple and clear with my expectations and the reinforcement that I provide and my responses to appropriate and interfering behaviors. Sometimes I want to lecture because it makes me feel good to lecture because I want to hear myself rationalize what's happening. But the reality is, is that you and I understand that that's not always effective. When I have a very clear expectation of when this happens, this is exactly how I re will respond. I don't have to do a whole lot of talking. It becomes an, a rule. And this is just what you can expect when this occurs. So making sure that we are very simple and clear with our expectations is important. And we can do that in a variety of ways. And we let's think about just society in, in general. When we think about, I'll go back to that. When we think about simple and clear expectations, we can provide lists for those. We can provide visuals for those. We can provide um, a first and then a calendar. There are a lot of things that we can do to support setting very simple and clear expectations and reinforcement systems and how we respond. I always think about a contract when I buy something or I have to sign my name to something and I'm doing a contract. I don't want something that's 87 pages that I have to go through. I'm not going to read that. And, and, and how many of us, I mean, there might be a few of y'all that do, but I don't. I could be signing my life away and just put it on there. And they know I'm not going to read that. But how nice is it when I have something that's very clear and says this is exactly what you're agreeing to? So if we think about it, we even use that as adults. We use visuals. We use contracts. We use our signature as a first and then, but we have something there. And when that contract gets broken, that's the first thing that someone's going to pull up. Like you agreed to make these payments. You agreed to do this. This was part of our agreement. So there are ways for us to create those with our kids as well. And I have teachers do that all the time. They create contracts. When you do this, this is what you get. This allows me to be consistent in the way I respond. And this allows you to have very consistent expectations. Again, I can do that with visuals, with pictures, with a token system, like they earn, think about like earning stars or earning points. We do these kind of things all the time in education and they are very effective with a lot of our students. One of the things that we do have to keep in mind is communication. 
And when we, when our child has difficulty with articulating their thoughts, communicating their wants and needs, this can be a huge thing. And we have to take that into expect, you know, into uh, consideration. So I think about my daughter who was struggling with some things lately and, you know, it was behaviors that I had not seen. And when I asked her, she could not, you know, she said, it's, it's all in my head, but it's confusing. And that was the way she was trying to explain, like, you know, she was trying to explain, I, and she told me, I understand, but I can't stop thinking about it, or it's all in my head and it, and it's confusing. And so I was able to say, Hey, she may not be able to articulate everything that she's thinking or feeling. And this happens with adults. This happens you know, with individuals without disabilities all the time. And so I want us to just remember that communicating our feelings and our thoughts and the reasons why certain behaviors occur can be difficult for anybody. It can also be challenging for anyone when they are receiving information. So when they are receiving information about how to fully understand the consequences to things, how to fully understand how to process those expectations. And that is why having things like visuals and like schedules are so extremely important. Whenever I go into a classroom and the teacher says, my students are out of control, or I have a student that is out of control, one of the first things that I ask for is, where is the student's schedule? And I say that for a reason. It goes back to the very beginning when I said consistency and expectations. What have we put into place so that there is our, this student or this child understands what is expected of them and when it is expected of them? And do you have that schedule in place? Do you have, and guess what else a schedule does? A schedule helps support independence. I know without a doubt that my daughter empties the trash and unloads the dishwasher, checks the laundry at the same time every single day. Without fail, I could literally open up the door at 4.15 and tell you exactly what she's doing. If the dishwasher needs to be emptied, she's emptying it because that is on her schedule. That means that she's being independent. I don't have to go in there and say, Riley, don't forget, or remember, you're supposed to, hey, she's independent. She can do it on her own. And it is because it's become a habit and she has a schedule and she responds to that schedule. And it didn't just happen overnight, just like no schedule for us happens overnight. We have to become acclimated to that schedule and create it as a habit. I'm not one of those people that takes my makeup off and does a whole makeup routine you know, where I take it off and I put on a tone. I don't know. I see people do that. And I'm always like, how do they do that? Well, it becomes a habit. And when they first buy those 87 products that they buy to put on their face, they don't know right off the bat exactly which one to do. They're going to watch a video. They're going to look at the information that was sent when that makeup was shipped or when they bought it. They're going to put a number one, a number two, a number three on the bottle. Why? Because it's not a habit yet. And they have to have that support to say what comes first, then what comes next, and what comes next, then it becomes a habit. Then you can say, hey, I didn't just waste this $500 or $200 on all these products. I'm actually going to use them. It becomes a habit that I do it. Think about people who buy expensive workout equipment and never touch them and never get on them, and they lay clothes on them. I'm those people. I've done that before. And so I can tell you that I had to put certain things in place to tell myself, I'm going to force myself to follow a certain habit and a certain schedule. I had to schedule it in. I had to put my workout clothes in a certain spot so that I saw them. And if I passed them, I felt guilty. And then I wanted to hide them and be like, I didn't see that. But I did because they were laying right there. I had to write it in. And then I had to reward myself when I did things. So when I was able to say, hey, I exercised five days this week. I wanted praise. I wanted somebody to say, I know you didn't want to, but you did it good for you. Or maybe I wanted to go buy myself something when I was able to uh, become healthier or fit into something or, or maybe just to reward myself. I rewarded myself on Friday after I exercised all week. These are all systems that adults put into place for themselves to develop healthy habits. 
And they do that using visual supports and their environment. So keep in mind how important. I have things, my daughter is in, in, a, in a, she is a habitual cleaner. She wants to clean and organize everything. And I will come in and say, why are my salt and pepper shakers over here? Why did you move them? And it may seem like a little deal, but to me, it's a big deal because when I'm cooking, I want my stuff to be in the right spot. So after the 15th time that she moved them, I thought, what am I doing? I know better than this. I put a visual. I actually taped it down to the cabinet that said, do not touch. And it was a do not touch sign. And guess what? She hasn't moved them since then. She saw that and she recognized, and I took her to it and said, this says, do not touch. I do not want you to touch my salt and pepper shakers. It upsets me while I'm cooking when I cannot find them. Do not move them again. This is the sim you know, this is the sign to remind you when you think about moving my salt and pepper shakers because you're cleaning my kitchen. While I appreciate that, do not move these. So she will clean all around them and she will not do that. Guys, we respond to visual cues all day long. We can remember when COVID, when we were in um, the middle of COVID and we had dots on the ground at the pharmacy, they were, we knew what six feet were. I mean, we understand six feet, but why do we have those there? Because it's a visual reminder of what's expected. Think about going through the airport. They give you ample warning before you get up there, what you need to have out. They remind you, have your driver's license out. Now, without fail, you're gonna get behind someone who doesn't have their driver's license out. But the reality is, is they're trying to tell you way before you get up there with visuals. We respond to visual cues all day long. And so it, it only makes sense that we offer that when we are trying to remind someone of the expectation or when we are trying to teach a new behavior or a new skill. When we are approaching challenging behaviors, I would ask you to think about it this way. Instead of thinking, don't do this. Because that's what we're thinking. Trust me, I know that's what we're thinking. I did that. Don't touch my salt and pepper shakers. Instead, I want to be able to say what to do instead. I have to try to say, what can I do instead of that? So if I have a child where I'm trying to tell them, don't throw a fit because you want this, what else can I teach that child to do so that they get what they want instead of throwing a fit? Does that make sense? I'm trying to do a replacement behavior. And let's think about this like, um, let's think about smoking. Smoking is a habit that many people have had for, you know, I, I was a previous smoker and, and I understand this. And it was a very hard habit, you know, very hard behavior to break. And I can remember going through after being a smoker for like 30 years. I mean, it was, a, you know, a, a very long time. And I can remember stopping that by saying, what can I do instead? So I was in the habit, I had a behavior established of going outside and sitting down by myself. And I would say, but I like that time. I like to get out by myself. I like to have a little bit of breathing room to sit outside. Well, what am I going to do instead of smoke? So that way, instead of focusing all of my thoughts and my energy on what I'm not doing and what I'm not getting to do, I tried to focus as much as I could on what I'm going to do instead. And so if I look at certain situations in the school and I say, well, he's ripping his paper up because he doesn't want to do the work. And they're like, I know, and we can't do that. We Do not rip your paper up. And I'm like, it, what are we going to? So what he's telling you is, is he doesn't want to do the work. I get it. You know, I totally get it. Now, I'm not saying it's acceptable, but I get it. But what are we going to teach this student to do instead of ripping his paper up? What would be acceptable for me as an educator to have instead of a teacher, a, a child saying or a student ripping up a paper, would you be OK if he says, can I do something else instead? Can I have a break? Can I get help? What are we trying? You know, what else can we teach this kid to do other than destroying the paper? What's acceptable? If I was a new student in your class tomorrow and I said, well, I don't want to ask for help. Everybody else is doing it and I don't want to look like I don't know, but this is really hard. What else might you think would be appropriate? And they would say, well, I would be OK if they asked for a break. And I was like, perfect. OK, well, then instead of saying don't rip your paper up and focusing all of our energy on that, why don't we teach them how to how to ask for a break? 
and when they can ask for a break and maybe having a break card that they can give you. So try to approach this by saying, instead of thinking, don't do this, I'm going to approach it and say, if I have interfering behavior, I want to say, why don't we do this instead? If you want this, instead of screaming and crying, let's give you a visual to come and ask for it. Let's teach you how to ask for it. Let's teach you how to ask for a break or let's teach you how to do it independently. We just went through where I told you my daughter was moving my salt and pepper shakers around everywhere. And so when I noticed this was kind of becoming a habit with other things, when I would see her begin to start moving things around the house and kind of some, some maybe obsessive compulsive type behaviors, I said, hey, it looks like you might want, you know, why don't you go take a walk? And so instead of me saying, quit touching this, don't touch this, I said, hey, let's go take a walk for a little bit. Let's walk around the block, go play with the kitten. You know, let's go take the dog outside and let him go to the bathroom. I was doing everything I can to try to say, I'm going to try to find something that will replace this behavior that she's doing, but I want her to get the same feeling. And maybe she was doing this behavior of, constant cleaning and moving things around because she was trying to stay busy. And it dawned on me, you know, this is downtime for her. And I think she's trying to keep herself busy when she's not on the phone and when she's not at work and when she's not at play practice, maybe she's bored. I mean, could that be it? And so I thought, I'm going to try that approach. So every time I see that behavior occurring or I have a schedule in place where I say, hey, this is going to be your time where you're going to go walk the dog. So you're going to get the dog and you're going to take them out to go to the bathroom. And it should take you about 15 minutes that I'm trying to replace a different behavior instead of her doing that excessive cleaning and moving things around. All right. Now, when we think about how we're teaching new behaviors, I can't just say, hey, Riley, go out there and take care of the dog. Maybe she'd never taken the dog outside before on a walk. So just like any other skill, when I'm looking at new behaviors, like when I'm trying to teach a child how to ask for a break and not rip up the paper, or maybe how to only, you know, how to clean up when they get out their toys and they have their one box of toys now, how to clean that up. How do I teach any skill? And I had to go back and say, how do we teach our kids how to brush their teeth? How do we teach our kids how to get dressed? We taught them. And Then you do this and then you do that. And then the other thing that we did was we modeled that behavior. So after I gave her a step-by-step -step guide of exactly what to do with visuals or a schedule, I modeled it. And let's think about teaching them to brush their teeth. We modeled it. Look at me. I'm wetting the toothbrush. I'm putting the toothpaste on. Then I brush my teeth. So I gave them a step-by-step -step way to do it. But I also modeled how to do it. And then I had her do it. Now, I got behind her. Remember, I know you remember teaching your kid to brush their teeth where you get behind them and you help them hold the toothbrush because you want them to get back there at those back teeth. So you're helping them by saying, yep, that's right. You're doing it. So you're prompting them. You may even be giving them a physical prompt with hand over hand, like this is how you spread the peanut butter and the jelly. But if I think about it, I gave them a step-by-step -step way to do it. I modeled how to do it, and then I allowed them to do it, and I gave them feedback by like, good job. That was perfect. You're, you're putting just the right amount of toothpaste on. Now, remember, you've got to get back there with your back teeth. That is supporting them, and in the end, it becomes a habit, a new behavior, a new skill that they've learned. So remember all the skills that we teach our kids. We have to teach them appropriate behaviors the same way because that's a skill. So if I want to teach my child to respond appropriately or safely around the pool, I have to teach them that. I have to give them a step-by-step -step visual reason or guide of exactly how to walk around the pool being careful. Then I have to model that. Look, I'm walking all the way around because I don't want to slip in that water or I don't want to get in, you know, without that, you know, without that life jacket. So I have to put my life jacket on however I'm going to do it. And then I watch them do it. I give them feedback and then eventually I can fade the support and prompts. So just remember when you think about how you've got this interfering behavior, 
And now you want to teach the appropriate behavior, but how do you teach appropriate behavior? Well, you teach it the same way you do any other skill with a step-by-step -step guide, modeling the correct way to do it and giving them feedback. And we do behavior skills training, social skills training in school settings where it's like, how do you sit at the lunch table with a new friend? How do you share your toys? And we are very specific. You have a toy. When your friend sits down, say to them or hand them the toy and say, your turn. Now you practice with me. I'm going to show you what that looks like. Now you do it with me and then I'll give you feedback. That was great. That was wonderful. You know, or it's my turn. Let's remember I set a timer and now it's my turn. So we have to teach those new behavior skills the same way we do any other skill. And one of the last things that I think that it is important to consider is we cannot discount the possibility of when we're having uh, our children exhibit challenging behaviors. Could this be a medical issue? Y'all, sleep deprivation does a lot to people. And we know that when our children are not sleeping the appropriate time, when they maybe are not eating the appropriate foods, when they are not getting a well-balanced um, schedule that gives them downtime and challenging things, maybe outdoor time, exercise, all of those things can definitely affect behavior. So I always consider, is it a medical issue? Am I giving my child ample time to do certain things or is there too much downtime or could we be looking at something that could be related to medical, sleep, food, things like that? Also, always consider when it's a safety issue to reach out for in-home behavior support. Um, in your state, you know, uh, you may have board certified behavior analysts that are available or other supports that are available to come in and offer behavior support and training. And that's a great thing to have. And it's nothing to feel um, uncomfortable about. I don't want you to think that, you know, I, I can understand where one might be like, I don't know about having somebody in my house. But if the behavior is occurring at home, it's important sometimes for us to see the environment so that we can say, hey, this is not a big deal, but let's just box up these toys then you're not fighting that battle every day of picking up toys and we're not having tantrums. Why don't we have this solution? And I always tell people it is much easier to look at things from the outside. And I learned that when I was a teacher and someone would come in and say, well, why didn't you just move that? And I was like, okay, smarty pants. And I was like, you know what? That's excellent. actually a great point. But at the time I couldn't see it because I was in the middle of crisis or I was in the middle of dealing with challenging behaviors. So just keep in mind that having someone come in sometimes to see it from the outside can be a very helpful thing. And the other thing is, is that it may be necessary sometimes when we're dealing with very significant behaviors for us to consider medication or additional behavior skills training or supports. And so just like everyone else, and you guys know this, our children our adult children and our children who are young, you know, they are not, um, you know, immune from depression, from anxiety, from, um, you know, fear, from trauma. Those are all things that are very much, you know, possible in their life is with anyone else. And so I always make sure that we don't discount that. Uh, and I can tell you just from my personal experience, both of my children have anxiety. Both of my children struggle with OCD type behaviors. And when I do everything that, you know, I've been able to do with both of my children, I am able to say, you know what, if this is not effective, then I would definitely want to make sure that I consider speaking with my physician to see if possibly medication may be something that I would consider. So I am going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and drop my email in the chat and then also look at some of the questions that we have up here. So uh, on a behavior plan is tantrum an actual category. So it depends. So when we think about my son is going to general ed every day right now, so I don't understand how he will not receive one. Okay, so here's what we think about. Mm -hmm. This is just me talking to you as another parent. 
I am very, very cautious about giving a one-on-one -on -one to any child. Now, there is exceptions. If we are talking about significant behaviors or behaviors where it's a danger. You know, if I have a student who's running out of the building, then absolutely, you know, I'm going to consider that. Or if I have a student with self-injurious behavior, I definitely consider that. But it is always with the plan of how are we going to fade that one-on-one -on -one support. And the reason why I tell you this, and this is not always a popular answer. I get a lot of, you know, I'll get pushback from this and I totally get it. But this is what I come back and say. When we have a one-on-one, -on -one, it sort of sets our kids up in a situation where it's not reality and it doesn't foster independence and it prevents them oftentimes from being able to create meaningful relationships and meaningful experiences in general education. Um, now, again, if we're talking about significant behaviors where it's a danger and I'm worried about this kid, like, hey, you, this is something I worry about want the kid to do this, then I would most definitely understand that, but always with the idea of fading that support. Because the reality is, is that when your child becomes 25, there's probably not going to be a one-on-one -on -one available for them, unless it's you. Yeah. Um, the other thing is when we think about tantrums, when we look at a behavior plan and we think about tantrums, we want to make sure it's defined correctly. If I just saw tantrum, I'd be like, well, you know, what does that look like? What does that sound like? Um, and so when we think about a tantrum, we want to make sure that a behavior plan defines it appropriately. So they are saying exactly what a tantrum looks like. Crying, laying on the floor, throwing items, spitting, hitting, kicking. You know, how are they describing a tantrum? And sometimes I tell them, now remember, that's a bunch of behaviors wrapped up in one word. So we want to make sure that we are separating them up appropriately. So if I had a tantrum where there was not physical aggression or destruction of property, so they're not, you know, flipping desks or breaking windows, but they're just crying and laying in the floor, then I would want to make sure that I define that, that they're crying, they're yelling no, they're laying in the floor. Once we start to look at additional behaviors such as physical aggression, self-injurious behaviors, biting myself, hitting myself, breaking windows, breaking chairs, that becomes another behavior. So as long as that tantrum is defined appropriately and, and thoroughly, and it is just confined to being able to say they yell no, they push their paper away, they lay on the floor, they cry. I can see where that would be defined as a tantrum, but just make sure it's defined appropriately. Because once you start adding in some other behaviors, like they're running out of the room, well, that's not a tantrum. That's eloping. That's leaving the environment. Or they're hitting me. That's not a tantrum. That becomes physical aggression. Or they're hitting themselves. That becomes self-injurious behavior. So we want to make sure that why we are targeting a behavior, because we're going to have to collect data on it. And so while we're targeting tantrum, we want to make sure we defined it. And then once it begins to expand outside of what's been defined, it no longer is a tantrum. It becomes another behavior, if that makes sense. And then I can see what if transitions are the main cause and how would you word that in an IEP? OK, when we are looking at transitions that are occurring, we would want to make sure we describe it. So are we talking about transitions out of the room? Are we talking about transitions in the room? Are we talking about transitioning environment, like coming in from the playground, going to music, coming into the classroom, leaving the lunchroom? Or are we talking about transitions within an activity? So in other words, I have to stop the computer and write words. Uh, I have to stop PE. Uh, and and do something else, or maybe I'm inside the classroom and my favorite subject is science and I love science. And when science is over and I have to do math, I do not like math. And so maybe then the transition is within the classroom. So one of the first things that I would ask is wh what are we talking about for a transition? Are we talking about inside the classroom, 
outside the classroom, coming and going to different environments, like leaving and getting on the school bus, coming off the school bus. And that will let you know, are we talking about transitions that are not just activity transitions, but more environmental transitions, if that makes sense. And yes, absolutely. I love it that you said antecedent. You spoke to my behavior intervention hard because when we think about antecedents, that is going to be what I look for is immediately occurring before the behavior. And that becomes like what is happening immediately before the behavior, because that gives us an idea of what the function of that behavior may be. So when I look at that and say, hey, as soon as I asked this child to do math, they had a tantrum then that's going to help me understand that it may be math that could be a trigger. And so that is very important. Um, okay, when I try to fade after teaching a skill, my son says, I need help. We've practiced this skill for a very long time. It seems like he doesn't want to become independent or he wants attention. I've seen that before. I definitely understand that. Um, and so here's the way to look at that. Sometimes we need more positive feedback than others. Some people need more positive feedback than others. And it could very much be attention. So here's something that we could do. If we are trying to get an individual to demonstrate a skill that we feel like they have the skills to do, has he been able to show you before that he can do this skill? Uh, like he's done it independently before. Do we know for sure he can do it? And if we say yes, we know for sure we've seen him do it before. Then I would have to say, hey, there's things I know how to do, but what's the payoff for me? <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. What am I getting out of this? And so sometimes we have to say, what if we approach this by withholding or reserving something that is rewarding by saying, hey, Whenever you finish picking up all of these toys by yourself, uh, because you practice this, you know he can do it, you've seen him do it before, then we're able to go do something and pick something that you know he really, really likes and that's really, really rewarding to them. Then that way that will let you know that it might have been more of the payoff. Then you have to ask yourself, hey, that lets me know that they may need a reward when they finish something, because they don't have the desire yet to do that independently. But one of the other things that I would say is I am really big. I don't know how old your child is, but my daughter is very big on taking pictures of things when she completes them. You know, we live in an Instagram society, right? So she wants to take a picture of after she does something, look what I've done. And guess what? I encourage it. I tell her, hey, take a picture when you're finished and send it to me on your phone. And then that way I can give her all the accolades. And she loves that. You know, she loves to post those kind of things or do Snapchat when she's finished making her lunch or braiding her hair or doing whatever. I'm like, great, wonderful. Let's take a picture of that so you can get all the snaps and all the accolades that you want. So it's figuring out what's reinforcing and what made the payoff be. And it very much could be that they need that attention. So I would see if you could offer that attention from afar, which may be, hey, take a picture of that and send it to me and I'm going to post it or I'm going to share it with grandma or I'm going to share it with mom or we're going to brag on this and give you a lot of heart emojis or whatever we can do. Um, so it very well could be attention seeking, but I think we also need to look and make sure for a fact that they've got um, the skill set to do it. And then I think someone has their hand raised. Bianca, yeah. Hi, sorry. Um, my house is a little hectic with the little ones. So no, sorry fine. about that. Um, I just wanted to clear up that my questions came because my son is seven in second grade. He goes to gen ed an hour a day. Mm -hmm. And the transition from special ed to gen ed and back are really like, that period is difficult and I, I make sure not to have the word tantrum in his IEP because it's, I don't think it's appropriate. I'm like, uh -huh. can inst I know that there's these expectations and goals for him, but what are you, what is the actual plan set 
to prevent these behaviors, what is the antecedent? And they don't respond or um, explain the prevention plan. Oh, well, that's 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 a red flag. So here's what you want. You want to make sure that all behavior plans have antecedents, you know, and here's why. Number one, we want to make sure that that we that's part of prevention is understanding the antecedent and knowing what to do to prevent the behavior. And so because that's how we decrease the behavior. So I would absolutely ask for a behavior plan to be done that includes a prevention plan to prevent tantruming behaviors. And when you brought up that it's transitioning back from general ed, uh, going back into the special ed classroom, or is it leaving the special ed classroom and going to the general ed classroom? I think it's just it, like, because in the classroom, he's great with transition, especially if it's consistent. Uh -huh. Like, like if the classroom is consistent, consistently with routine, but it's that transition of walking to and from passing by playground, um, running into a family member at school. So it's like all these small distractions. Sure. Kind of like don't want him to go back and forth. OK, so one of the things that may be something to consider is. If it is more of like the actual physical transition of walking from one location to the next, this is a possibly a thought. We used to offer transition tools or transition things that they held that they could be very um, engaged with, that they really, really liked. So if I had a child that loved Thomas the Train, I might let them hold Thomas the train only when we walk in the hall. That's the only time you can have it. And that was the schedule that you put it in the Thomas box when you got in, but you could hold it walking in the hall. And we consistently gave them that opportunity, you know, to allow their, their focus to be on something other than all the distractions that are going on while they're walking. I think that the, another thing that may be something to consider is having something, an activity or a token or a reinforcement of some kind when walking in the hall is successful. But you have to make sure you define what is a successful transition. That's where it becomes tricky is you want them to define what is a successful transition. We know we don't want them to cry. We know we don't want them to run towards the playground or run towards his aunt if he sees his aunt or his cousin or a sister or a brother in the hallway. What is what is the transition supposed to look like? And if the teacher come back and comes back and says, hey, I want him to walk from this classroom to this classroom within three minutes without you know running from me, without getting within four steps of me, without crying, uh, you know, be able to truly define what it's supposed to be like. Then we might have in place that once he gets to the desired location, like once we get to spot B back to the special ed classroom or to the general ed classroom or however, that's where something that is truly rewarding for him is waiting after that successful transition has been done. Does that make sense? And that may be a great approach to do and making sure it's something that's earned. The other thing is giving him ample time to practice. If the only time that he is out of that classroom and walking in the hall and able to interact and pass by things that are exciting and fun and see other people that he may not get to see, could it be that he really wants to see his brother and sister and he sees them in the hall and he really gets overwhelmed or he loves the playground so much that just simply walking by it is, is very overwhelming? One, I would say, is there any way to avoid walking by that? But two, is this student getting enough opportunities to engage in those things that he really likes to do? And if so, then, you know, if not, then I would say maybe we need to build more practice into walking. If I just have to practice one time a day walking from point A to point B, it may be easy for me not to get it right because I'm only doing it one time a day. So I want to increase the amount of time spent walking in the hall so that he learns the appropriate way to do it. 
And so maybe giving, allowing him the opportunity to walk in the hall when you run up to the office to go turn something in, when you go to meet, you know, to pick up the lunch trays, to drop this off, to turn in attendance, to pick this up, giving him that opportunity to walk is going to allow him more opportunities to practice appropriate transition. Does that make sense? If he's only getting it one time a day, that's like me saying, okay, you know, learn to use a spoon every time you eat, as many times during the day as I can, so that you have a lot of potential to practice doing it the right way. So that may be an additional thing to consider. But anytime someone brings up the idea that there is not a behavior plan that addresses the antecedents and prevention, then that makes me extremely nervous. And that is definitely something that you want to address with the school district by simply requesting an additional ARD meeting and that a functional behavior assessment be done that includes prevention. Uh, how are they going to prevent this? I wanted to add that because um, you mentioned visuals and my son kind of did that too when he was little and we um, created like little uh, storybooks, mm -hmm. you know, just having him practice those things before he had to do the the actual thing. You know? Absolutely. It's, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's like me getting on itinerary before I go on a trip. It's very helpful or else you're going to drop me off in the middle of a town I've never been in before. And it may be chaos, you know? So me having an itinerary is extremely helpful and it allows me, and how many times am I going to look at exactly like a map? Where am I going? What am I doing? What's expected? What's of me? Yeah. So, yeah. That's yeah. Like um, there's like for the behavioral assessment, it's like, these are the expectations. We want him to do this, do this, do this. And I'm like, okay, but, this IEP meeting is to talk about why he, like, what's the cause? Are we looking at the antecedent? Are we looking, how are we preventing the behavior? Yeah, he has behavior, but it's not because he has Down syndrome. It's because there is something causing the behavior. And he's also nonverbal. He's mm -hmm. also not toilet regulated. And his muscle tone, you know, affects his writing. And I mentioned these, these things in the meeting. I show... A visual of what a Down syndrome learning profile looks like to the whole team. And um, I always ask, like, in writing, do you guys have a prevention plan? I understand he has behaviors, but what's causing the behaviors? Are you working with real behaviorists or just people from school, though? <laughs> I mean, from the, for right now, it's, it's the <laughs> district that I'm kind of mm -hmm. dealing with a little harder. Mm -hmm. I, I'm starting ABA at home. Um, which I know they're going to give me way more information to help me, yeah. but at school, it's like, I'm not there. So I'm like, I know my son's very well behaved. So what's causing this, these behaviors at another environment where I'm not there. And well, they don't sure you want to make sure that you're requesting a functional behavior assessment. They have to address the antecedents and the why, what is the function of the behavior? avoidance, escape, you know, you want a functional based assessment. So make sure you request an FBA and that the FBA be uh, include antecedent interventions. Uh, and with an FBA, if it's done ethically by anybody who is a behavior analyst or a behavior technician, it will always include antecedents and prevention strategies, always. And then that's why I asked for the one-on-one. -on -one, um, because of that transition to gen ed and uh -huh. being in the gen ed classroom and then him not be like he just got his AAC device so he's learning that device trying mm -hmm. to talk to his friends and participate yeah. and he's not toilet regulated so that's why I show all these things why he deserves a one-on-one -on -one. and I and I mentioned to them it's not forever yes. eventually the one-on-one -on -one will fall back and he'll do things independently, but his environment right now is too restrictive. Okay. And that's where I think that, you know, them having, and you want to make sure they have a plan in place of how they're going to fade back that one-on-one -on -one support to build independence. That's going to be extremely important. But first things we want to make sure is that 
you know, you want to make sure that they are addressing things like appropriate communication and speech and language therapy, uh, teaching him how to use his device effectively, uh, addressing toileting issues as well. But having a functional based behavioral assessment is going to be huge in providing you that why. You know, why are these behaviors occurring? They have to observe your child in multiple settings. So that means they have to observe them in general ed and special ed, in the hallway, the cafeteria, everywhere. Because what they're trying to do is exactly what I said. They're trying to look for patterns. They're trying to say, hey, is it every time that he's in the hall? Is it just the hallway? Is every other time he fine? You know, that's where having a really good behavior assessment is going to help you plan, help you determine the appropriate interventions and what additional skills need to be taught and what you can do to prevent challenging behaviors so that they don't become learned behaviors, which are like habits. And so that is going to be the most important thing. And remember, as a parent, you can only sometimes juggle one thing at a time. You know, so right now it feels very overwhelming. You're talking about communication. You're talking about toileting. You're talking about behavior. You're talking about least restrictive environment. That's a lot. That would be a lot. That's like me telling you, I need you to learn French and German. And then I need you to learn how to do a hot air balloon. You would be like, lady, just pick one. Okay. You know, so right now we have to realize that oftentimes it's overwhelming for him when there are a lot of expectations that fall under different areas. And it may be that we have to focus on one or two things at a time. So definitely, I would say completing the functional based assessment. Once that is done, it will help you when you start to advocate for things like least restrictive environment or a one-on-one. -on -one. That will help you in advocating once you get the results of that functional-based assessment. And Thank you. I really appreciate it because I know what I'm trying to tell them and I send them yeah. resources and yeah. you know um, links to like research that I've seen. But it's like they just keep pushing it off or mm -hmm. not showing the prevention plan. Are you with, like, um, may I ask, are you with LAUSD? No, we just moved to the uh, San Bernardino district. Oh, okay. Well, so it's it's kind of similar, but they're just bigger. Mm. It's not like sub districts, it's just like a whole district. So mm. I could I come in, you know, with everything. I come in with visuals, I come in with his learning. Um challenges what strategies i come in with a full everything mm -hmm. to make sure it's individualized but having a prevention plan i think is what's hurting him in the long run because it's like yeah he has behaviors but what's yeah. causing so, them yeah something really quick uh though um i uh, um you can actually have uh, behaviors come to school and work with your son as, as the one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, you probably have to use a lawyer and stuff, but we, if you want, you can always call me or Angela, but um, uh, because we're coming to an end of this presentation. Yes, but, um, I just dropped my email in there, Sandra, for you guys, please. and I'm going to send over a copy of the uh, PowerPoint as well, so that that way you will have that. I do have to hop and um, head out, so Sandra, I'm going to uh, send over a link to the PowerPoint, and I've dropped my email in there. And just let me know if there's anything else that I can do to assist with anything. Thank you so much. We uh -huh. appreciate Thank it. Thank you very Thank much. You. And, and I'm going to appreciate over that link. Thank you. And we appreciate everyone else who's joined the call. Um, but um, Bianca, if you um, have any more questions, you know, send me an email, send Angela an email. Because there's a lot of, you know, um, when my son was your uh, your son's age, I know we went through a lot also because of behavior. So we can share a little bit of resources with you and some of the things you can do at school or what things you can ask at school and who can support you, you know. Um, but definitely, I just want to make sure that you know that you have options like getting a, a behavior. Is it, you know, they call them BII, you know, uh, BID, BII at school. 
So it's not like a one-on-one -on -one from school. A lot of times the one-on-one one -on -one from school, from the district, don't have um, the knowledge on behavior. So that's really tough, you know. So anyway, I just wanted to say that before you go in case we don't get in touch with again, but uh, because those are some of the options that you can have at school. Alrighty, but thank you so much everyone for joining us and um, we'll see you at the next um, presentation. Uh, the walk is coming up November 3rd and if you want to join us, please do so. You can go to our website, start your team, come with your family and friends. We would really appreciate your support. Um, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye.